Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. Today, I'm joined by Danielle Sebastian. She is the founder of Resilient Wives. She's a coach, speaker, and she is a brand builder. So expect a lot of excellent thought leadership today as we're talking about what does a resilient wife look like? What is the program and what is her expertise? Uh, today, we're going to be talking in particular about how childhood trauma impacts your everyday life. And we're going to weave it in and out of the relationship, your kids, the whole, the whole space. Danielle, welcome so much to the show. Thank you so much, Jay. I am so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes. So excited. So let's, let's jump right in. Walk us through like the beginning, like what is this? What's the work? We have some terms that we understand, but cue us up into the topics of, of what we're going to talk about today. Absolutely. And I'm going to start with my story because I think that will get you where you need to be um, to understand where I'm coming from. So 12 years ago, I married my dream guy on a beach in Kauai. And it was amazing. We had um, we brought a stepdaughter into our family and she was our flower girl. And it was absolutely amazing. So we returned home and it was a little bit after we were married that I started to just notice some behaviors that I wasn't quite sure about. I couldn't put my finger on it. So there were a lot of control issues in our relationship and things like needing to control the environment. So very particular about things like where the shades were, you know, how far they were up or down where things were placed in the house, as well as just some control in the relationship, controlling, you know, how close we got, those kind of things. And it okay. started to create a lot of tension. So this is more than just, you know, you having some idiosyncrasies and, you know, wanting some things a particular way. It was really causing a lot of conflict in the relationship. I also started to notice a lot of withdrawal. So when when there was any sort of conflict or any issues in the relationship, things that I could see other people getting through, it would cause a lot of withdrawal. So the silent treatment that I was constantly on eggshells wondering what I would say that would cause this withdrawal. And by withdrawal, I mean like down in the basement with the door locked for days, not Got coming it. out very impactful to the relationship, as well as just every time it seemed like we would get closer, there would be pulling away. So I really, I tried everything. I looked everywhere. I tried all the relationship, you know, advice. I tried the love languages, everything to try and get through it. And we ended up having a very tragic event where I just decided, I think I've, I've had enough and it was only at this point when I pulled my toddler out of, out of preschool and decided to go live with my parents for a while. This was when my husband was able to reveal for the first time to anyone a terrible history of childhood abuse at the hands of the church. Okay. Oh, that's heartbreaking. That is heartbreaking. Yes. So and you what? can imagine this, this changed everything. Um, it was finally that thing that I just couldn't put my finger on that I was very hopeful that, oh, okay, now we know what's going on in the background here. So I think there's some things that we can do to make this better. I also realized into the process that that was very naive as well. This wasn't something that I was just going to be able to get some counseling and some couple counseling and a couple of months later, you know, we would be fine. I found out that the healing process is sometimes things get worse before they get better and healing is a journey and that really isn't something with an end point. So it was very important for us to develop the skills to be able to deal with the trauma deal with the trauma responses that will probably never go away, but that we can have the tools to deal with them in a healthier way. In your research, Danielle, have you, are there other elements and other behaviors 
that we can, well, do the first question is that we can see it in our partner or spouse. And then the other side is what are the things that we can do to tune in these behaviors ourselves to maybe do a self check to kind of just kind of be aware of. And I know it's for the feel good fathers listening here, this is like the impossible question because when you're in the trauma, you have no capacity to understand that you're doing this, but there might be something here. And and really we're just kind of exploring like, Hey, Danielle, you're an expert. You got this book, you're doing this thing, you know, we're, we're building it. Like, what do you perceive? Absolutely. So I do have a list of signs, things that I know now that I wish I would have known earlier that would have tuned me in to some of these, that this could be some of the problem, right? So just starting from the beginning, I remember when we were dating and even later into the marriage, any questions about childhood were avoided. So there was a lot of, you know, my, my, my childhood was fine. I, it was just very normal. And even to the point of, I just don't remember that much about my childhood, anything to avoid the childhood discussion. That's a, that's a big sign. Easy. It seems easy, but you, you just kind of brush over it, you know, when you're dating. And then the control is another thing. And the, what we need to understand about the control, which is hard when you're a partner, is that the control is to protect themselves. So it's very easy when you're in a relationship with someone who needs that control to think it's you, that they're trying to control you, right? Mm-hmm. Or trying to control everything around them, but it's really a safety mechanism that they use because their childhood was so out of control. Yeah. They need to have some of that control in their lives in order to feel safe. So I understanding totally that. that about the control, kind of that nuance there can is another sign. Got it. And I and I completely understand, you know, for the feel good fathers out there that are listening, there are many activities that we might do as a way to control either our time, effort, energy, or focus. So for instance, you know, one of the things that I struggle with is that I tend to, can like if I'm going through a really rough period, I tend to jump into a video game because a video game is an environment that I can control. I can get my dopamine. I can enjoy myself. I can get lost in the focus. I don't have to think about or deal with or deal with anything as I'm coping, but it's a coping strategy and not a dealing with or healing strategy. And so in that world, like I recognize that in myself. And so if I have that tendency, Uh, And actually one of my former mentors, Dax, he used to say this. He was like, when life is really good, I don't play games. When life is really hard, I play more games. And so we innately, I think we understand that we have these different activities that we will run into. And so for me and my generation, that might be video games, but for you and yours, it could be anything else. Hopefully it's not some sort of addictive substance or anything like that. Uh, but it's good to kind of pay attention to the ebbs and flows of your emotional state and what you're doing when things are good versus what you're doing when things are more challenging, your peaks and your valleys. Awesome. Uh, keep, keep going. So we had uh, avoidant history, like avoiding your history and the discussions, controlling your environment as a safety mechanism. I love the way that's framed. Uh, what other are on this list of signs? Uh, The pushing away, of course, trust is going to be a real, real difficult. Um, And that's really, uh, it really is hard in a relationship to, but you need to understand where it's coming from. Same thing with the control, that obviously they were hurt very badly by people that they trusted. So that is going to be difficult for them. It is something that can be overcome, but understanding that sometimes there's going to need to be a pulling back as things get closer, they have to feel very safe. Um, and usually by the time we get to the point where we're married, you know, where we've made that commitment, you would think, oh, that trust is that we've established it, but you continue to have trust issues, um, you know, moving forward because of that. I'm, I'm curious about your percep- your, your perspective on this piece, because I, I know I have my opinion on it, but uh, well, I'll just, I'll just cue this up. So, so for me, I have an agreement with my wife where there are some things that I can't carry. 
Like there's some things where it's like, I can support, I can walk alongside, I can love on, I can create space for, but you know, like when it comes to the trauma piece, like I can't carry that healing. That's not something I can do. Like, and so for us, there's been a discussion. I remember at one point I was going through a spiritual battle and she was like, you need to call your pastor. You need to go like, this is something like, come back, come, come tell me how things go and we'll work through it together. But for right now, and like this moment, this is the discussion to go have. This is the person to go see here. And I'm curious on your perspective on that piece, because I think you've got two sides. I think you have two, two scenarios in here, if I'm understanding your history a little bit correctly. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That is one of the core things that I work through with people is what a, what a spouse can be and what they can't be. And you are exactly right. There's also a lot of pressure, especially when the abuse has been a secret, for it to be kept private and also a lot of pressure for, you know, the, the spouse to, to not seek help and to be the person, the therapist, the, you know, the wife and everything to that person. And it's, it's not possible. We, you know, you as a spouse do not have the tools, you know, for trauma recovery. And it's, it's just not feasible to be that for everyone. And so definitely I recommend having a conversation between, you know, the two, the couple as to what kind of support do you both need and then making it a safe space. So for example, I was like, I need my friends and family. I need to have that outlet, but I want to it to be someone who you're comfortable with because there's certain friends probably that you're like, yeah, don't go to them, right? <laughs> they're they're going <laughs> to tell the whole world versus, yeah, I really trust that person and I'm okay with you going to them and, and being able to reach out. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, what would be the, what would be the structure of that? Let's, let's go mechanically that conversation, because this is going to be, I think the key point, right? We can be aware and we can identify and we can be as loving and as kind as we can be, but our words get in the way. And the way that we express ourselves is the, is the thing that we get in the way. And we're, we're interfacing with a person who is dealing with uh, a situation where they feel not safe. And so a person who is in fight or flight constantly, the language is going to be super critical. So I would love to hear your take. If, if this exists, is there a script? Is there a pattern to that conversation that can exist to broach this topic with your spouse, yeah, your spouse? <laughs> Absolutely. That is the majority of my work is scripting things out. So based off of how the trauma brain works and what they hear versus what's really happening, that is the key to really understand that. And so I do a lot of scripting with people about how that conversation can go can go well. And so the trauma brain is constantly looking for danger, seeking danger, and they sense danger even when it's not there. So this is another one of those, those signs, you know, that you may be seeing in your relationships. So things like, hey, would you mind helping with the dishes tonight? It can really feel to a trauma survivor like you're telling them they're not a good person or they're not a good husband. And so then it causes this visceral reaction and causes a lot of conflict in the relationship because the spouse is like, well, I just asked about the dishes and they're feeling very hurt. So that that is an example of, you know, where the you have to understand the partner's brain. And one of the things that I say first, one of the first steps when you want to have the conversation is that when those strong emotions and triggers occur, that is not the time to have the conversation. Nothing is going to go well when those heightened emotions are there. 
So taking a break, and that can be for a while, right? Until the emotions have died down before you can really have a productive conversation about what happened. And then, of course, the way that you frame it. Um, I've learned a lot of things where, you know, you start the conversation with, hey, I'd really like to talk about you know, what happened the, the, the night before. Um, I think that there might be some ways that we could handle it differently next time. And I'd like to see if you're open to talking about it. Awesome. So, um, hey, I've observed this behavior. This is what I think could be a potential solution. And then an enrolling statement. Would this be something that you're open to? Is this a good time to talk about it? Would you like to have this conversation, et cetera? And so it's very, it's very permissive, very soft language, very enrolling language. Yes. And definitely puts the person not on the defensive. Awesome. When they're, you know, they're already prone to that. Right. Right. Okay. So, um, I love this, uh, that's a really great example, right. Of, of handling any community. And, and I, I personally just, just for the record for everybody, I think that's a wonderful, uh, it's called nonviolent communication is, is that way to, to communicate with people. And that's just a lovely way to speak to people, whether they have trauma or not. Hey, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I think. Here's how I'm personally feeling. Would you be open to doing this next step with me? That's a great way to communicate in general. So um, uh, take note of that, feel good fathers. That's a that's a good way to communicate with your wife in general. Uh, I'm I'm really interested now in kind of going back into some of these other behaviors, right? So we had the history, the control, the pushing away, lack of trust. It sounded like there was um, you, you didn't quite hit it, but I'm kind of remembering Dr. Jenny Prohaska, who's a, a trauma. She does uh, first responders coaching and, and trauma work. And she talked about some other examples of like how this manifests. Would love to see a handful of other ways. And again, this is really from the perspective of, can you see this in your world with your spouse that you care about, or are you exhibiting this behavior? So are there any other major examples of things to just kind of, hey, let's keep our eyes open, our eyes, ears, and hearts open for this behavior? Yeah. The one I haven't touched on yet is probably the most most charged and difficult, and that is lashing out. Lashing out. So yep. We already talked about how they can sense danger, someone who's been through childhood trauma, even when it's not there, because they're so prone to looking for it everywhere, that that can come out in really two different ways that can be very difficult to understand. And that is, you know, just lashing out, um, blaming, you know, the other person, even though that what they said didn't mean you know, anything harmful, or I already touched on the withdraw, meaning that they freeze. And when I say withdraw, I touched on it before, but it's sort of a checking out. I call it like a flip is switched, hmm. where all of a sudden you, you can see that they're not processing anymore, that they're completely checked out from the conversation and they're checked out from themselves. And this can seem, you know, very difficult when you're in a relationship with, with this. But what I realized is that a lot of that checking out is, of course, they had to check out of what happened to them as children. So it's a coping mechanism that they use, and it comes out in their adult relationships. And sometimes it's protective towards the other person as well. They're so afraid of what they're going to say and how charged it's going to be that they'd rather check out from it than engage. Have you heard about the sympathetic, parasympathetic, and the dorsal responses? Yes. So that real, like I just, so my mind has been opened very recently to these concepts. The simp, I believe the sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight and the dorsal is the turning off and the deadening of everything. And so that's the kind of, it looks like rest, but that person is not resting at all. They've just completely, they've just shut off. And so they're not actually resting. They're likely reliving their trauma or doing whatever it is that their brain is doing. Um, are, is this something, uh, we'll get to lashing out, don't worry. But <laughs> so is this something that you're familiar with that is kind of interspersed in, in the resilient wives work that you do? 
It is. Um, and I think that you can get really deep into the, the mechanism. And so sometimes I'm like, yeah, that's all great. But what do I do as a spouse? <laughs> right. <laughs> Does that make sense? And so, I mean, it's very interesting to understand, you know, what's the, it, this is an absolute change in the brain and, you know, the way that your brain has been trained to respond. Um, but sometimes I'm just like, Hey, when you feel those, that, that light go flip, that's what's happening. They're having, they're being triggered and they're dissociating from the experience. So this is perfect because I think, I think the next logical point is similar to the last thing, lashing out in fights happen, diffuse, and there's a, there is like, sure there's a difference, but diffusal of the situation is, is a critical skill. How do we, how do we diffuse these situations again? And it's always another way that that person, as you're understanding, they need to feel safe. They need to feel hurt. They need to be validated, but they also need to understand not right now. That this is one of my tips that doesn't seem very intuitive. So our, our response when someone gets upset, right, is to jump in and try and make it better. What I've found because of the mechanism that you just talked about with with what's going on in the brain and how physical it is and they can't put their finger on it, I've actually recommend to people to to not engage in that moment. Oh, Meaning okay. to really just say, hey, I'm not quite sure what's going on here, but uh, I think we need to take a break because things are getting heated and leave. Yep. Take a real break from it. Um, so that both can sit back and be like, okay, what really happened here? And I'd love to give you a quick story example Do of yeah. how this plays out. So my husband, I've already mentioned that he likes to control his environment. And that's one of the techniques that he used similar to your video games, where when he is feeling stressed, when he is feeling out of control, he goes on kind of a crazy cleaning cycle cleaning the house and purging things from the garage, like taking everything out of the garage and you know, getting rid of a whole bunch of stuff that makes him feel safe. Well, one time it was in the summer and we have a teenage daughter and nothing makes a father feel more out of control than when their daughter is getting their driver's license. Correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I took my son um, on a little vacation to go see my parents and we left my husband at home and he was in the midst of really struggling with this loss of control of our teenager. So I, I get home and I'm starting to undo the dishes and I'm looking around and I'm like, where is all this stuff on my shelves? I'm, I'm just, everything is gone. And so I turn around and I look, we have all this shelving above our, our kitchen and it's stripped. None of the little knickknacks and things that I that I've had a decorator help us, you know, put together. It's gone. I go to the mantle, stripped downstairs. All of our shelves stripped, and I'm going, okay. As as a trauma informed spouse, what would you do? I freaked out. I absolutely lost it. I was like, where is all my stuff? What has happened here? And so I just was like, okay, I need to take a break. So I put on my running shoes, went for a run. And I'm thinking in my head, in the old days, I would have been like, what a jerk. If it isn't his way, it's the highway, right? I can't wait to tell, you know, my mom what happened here and how controlling he is. But me having done all this work on understanding how the trauma brain works and that that's a coping mechanism for him, instead on that run, I was able to come back and say, hey, let's just talk about, you know, why I'm so upset, you know, about the things. But I think that this might be because you're feeling out of control with our teenage daughter getting her driver's license, that you're doing that crazy thing that you do to feel safe by purging and cleaning. And by understanding that, then we were able to actually kind of laugh about it, Mm -hmm. right? Instead of it escalating like it would have in the past. 
I was, I was just thinking, I was like, oh, you guys probably had a good chuckle in that moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I'm like, you got into crazy mode, crazy yeah. cleaning mode. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think that's a really good that's a really good power to to be able to do that to activate that is, I, I think Danielle, you said something that's I think going to be really meaningful to feel good fathers is that um, healing is not a switch, right? And that some of these patterns and behaviors, like your brain is like a muscle, and so it's it's learning how to do something and learning how to process just a piece of information, and the the benefit and the curse of that construction physiologically is that your brain can then drop into these patterns of behaviors faster because it gets you to that safety quicker, right? That's why that works. Um, or in the other side, right? It gets you to success faster because over time, when you have a skill, you become better and better and better at the skill, right? It becomes a mastery. And so you're doing it unconsciously and you're having conversations while you're fixing dinner or whatever it happens to be, right? Whatever that skill happens to be, maybe it's a professional thing, but it's, you're dropping into these patterns and then being able to name it and have a chuckle and share like, oh yeah, that was a bit crazy or, oh yeah, you were a bit crazy or, oh yeah, that was that thing that happens here. Or did this person, you know, rear their head and, um, it's, it's the, the phenomena of like when it's in the dark, it has more control. It's like the boogeyman in the dark at night for kids is the scariest thing because they don't know if it's there. Whereas if it's just like, oh, let's turn on the light, right? Let's do this kind of thing, scared of the dark, right? We're afraid of what we don't know. And so we run away from it. But if we have a term for it, if we share it, if it's out in the open, if the light is shined on it, that's kind of the, one of the first ways to kind of begin the healing process. It releases the power that the trauma has over you when you can start to voice it and realize that it's it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's knowing that this is how you were able to survive and get to where you are today. There's nothing wrong with that, but we can do some different co coping mechanism, which is what the next part of our conversation was is, okay, so the next time that you're feeling really out of control. Is there something else we could do? Like go for a run instead of stripping all my shelves. <laughs> 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 um, and making me upset. So yeah. And bringing humor into it really, you know, making light of it. Cause it's heavy. Yeah. Childhood trauma is heavy. Yeah. So making it lighter is, is really helpful. Awesome. What is the, what's sort of the next step? Like what, you know, we've had, we have a couple of tools and techniques. We have a, a bunch of ideas, but like what, what's next for, for us? Yeah. So knowing again, as we've said before, that the trauma will never really go away. Those trauma responses will always be there. They will lessen with a lot of work, right? They will lessen and using these techniques. But as I mentioned, so when, we, when my husband and I got married and we're going through it, we had toddlers, toddlers and five-year-olds. And then you realize, oh my goodness, we have a whole nother set of triggers with adolescence. And then you have a whole nother set of triggers when you lose a family member. So knowing that there's going to be new circumstances that occur in your life where different triggers will come up. So the key is really what I just said, having a support system, being able to realize when you've when you've reached your breaking point and taking those breaks, as well as having the toolbox of techniques for diffusing the triggers and dealing with them healthier to take you through the long haul, through life, all the way to the end. We love the idea of community here in the feel good fatherhood world. This is the you know feel good fathers. It's absolutely critical that we have local familial talk about knowing your neighbors, this kind of stuff, the different levels of community. What is your take on the community in this particular aspect? And what is it, what's its structure and what does it look like? It needs to be creative and we need to realize that works, what works in your relationship may be something that somebody else thinks is crazy, right? And so I work through people with their main issues and I have boxes where we plan out support. So support for my husband, support for me, support for us as a couple, and then other support, like what kind of childcare 
do you need in order to ensure you get the breaks? What can you get a meal plan? Can you get meals delivered to your house when things are absolutely insane and you can't handle anymore? So really getting outside of the box and having this support like grid, essentially, that sometimes you're like, oh, I don't need that part anymore, but I know it's there and I can tap into it the next time I need it. I love that you said grit and I, and I love the analogy. So when you were talking about this, I was thinking about that famous Stanford study with the pain diodes. So they, they put the little connectors, the let little electric shock things on the people and they just would shock them. And it was a scale of like zero to 10. Like this isn't like shock, like electricity hurt you is more like, um, like a tightening, like it, they kind of just kind of tightens your muscles and it can create some pain. And what they found is, is that just at base, people, almost everybody stopped between like a three and a five, just in general on the, on the scale. Then they did another experiment. So that was their control group. They did the, the next leg of the experiment and they gave them a button and the, and the button was simply a thing you could push to stop the, stop the escalation of the electricity or whatever. And the results were absolutely fascinating. And it's directly related to what Danielle just said. What they found was that the people that had the button, they could tolerate like on average two levels higher pain. So the three to five went to five to seven because, and I think it's super related, right? So your husband had the control thing. So he, he needs the button to push the button to control what's happening in his life. But then on the other side, it's that out that grit. You know what? I don't always have to make dinner because here's the rest. Here's the takeout on speed dial. Here's the delivery on speed dial. Here's the Uber Eats. Here's the whatever. Here's our favorite restaurant. If we all get, you know, I wish we had more of this, but if we all get Panera, if we all get that sushi restaurant place that we all like, everybody's going to feel good about dinner tonight. Who's the, who's the, um, you mentioned childcare. I was like, yeah, who's the neighbor on the block? that you can just, Hey, can you watch the kids for an hour or two? We need to go do a thing. Right. And whatever that language is. So I love that. I love, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm dialing right now. I'm naming this. This is grit as the red button. That's what it is for you, Danielle. That's, that's the, that's the, the pillar point from now on. I love it. And just by giving people the empowerment, as you said, the control, the button to say, this is okay for you to do all this stuff and make it work for you. You, you know, you, you may not, you may think completely outside of what other people would think, you know, for watching your, your kids, <laughs> for example, who cares if it works for you guys, go for it. Don't worry about it. It's the lightning again, the lightning by having the support that you need is so freeing for people. I, I think here, the, the part that I'm hearing that we don't say enough, we don't say this enough in our regular everyday world is you do you. That core idea, whatever you've watched on, I don't even watch sitcoms, but Modern Family or I don't even know, what are, the, what are they? I don't even, I don't watch any of them. So any of those family dramas, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be what it's like in your house. It's when you're coming together, the two become one, you're creating a new culture. It's all the good and the bad of yours and all the good and the bad of hers, right? It's like, you're, you're accepting everything and hopefully you're being like genes and it's like, you're only keeping the best of both and you're constructing it. You know, the, the classic example for me is like, what movie are we going to watch at Christmas? What movie are we watching on Christmas Eve? Cause everybody's got their thing. You know, it's like, yeah. uh, so like my wife's family is like the black and white musicals, right? The Fred Astaire age stuff. But for Ooh. me and my family, it was the Muppet Christmas Carol. So it was like yeah. also a musical, but a little bit more modern. Also the Christmas, like it was the Christmas Carol, right? The classic Dickens story, gratitude about the present, et cetera, et cetera. All the, all the different kind of things. And we just settled. I won just so you know, I won. We watched we probably Christmas Carol, <laughs> but we do. But December is, is Christmas movie month. And so we just watch everything. And there's, there's a whole bunch of things there. Yeah. Another good example is date nights, right? Yes. Every relationship advice in the world is date nights. I'm like, when I schedule date nights, it is a disaster. It's kind of back to some of the control, right? And so what I figured out is 
don't schedule the date nights and wait for a good night. Wait for a night when the kids are, when the day wasn't crazy, when they don't have any activities, when my husband comes home and it's not a bad day. I'm like, hey, let's go for dinner. Let's go get dinner. So making it more spontaneous worked better for us. Mm. It's not what people would recommend, but it works better for us. I love that. I, and I think that, I, I think the critical thing here, and I like what, what has really been so apparent to me is the investment in your relationship that it's, it's not about like, I, I could almost, I could almost hear you say, Danielle, be damned what anybody else says, like be damned how anybody else structure this stuff. Like, I don't care about what you say. This is working for us. This has given us that passion, that intimacy, that safety, that relationship, the family model. This is giving us what's going to allow us to thrive. And that's, I think the, the key component here is that thriving element. Absolutely. I love that because that is where I don't think that we're often trained to be to be very empathetic to way, the way other things can be done. And I absolutely love that you can take back and step back and be like, does that work for us? No, I think our family vacation would be better if my husband just came for a couple of days instead of the whole week because you know, all the families there and it's too much, you know, maybe for the whole week for him, but people would think that's crazy and that it's not right, you know, but if that ends up working for you, go for it. I'm it. I love this example and I'll share a little story for me. So I was sort of introduced into a new style of vacationing with my wife and it's always been the, um, they're kind of a Disney family. So like the Disney and the beach and that kind of stuff, I found that environment the most stressful out of like now I love being on a secluded beach. You give me the beach and nobody else is around. I absolutely love it. But what I've realized for me is that I grew up in a cottage. So I grew up in Northern Ontario. And so we would drive two, three hours outside of Toronto where I grew up and we had family cottages. So we'd sit on the lake. There's nobody else around. I have my dock. I sit on the water. It's, it's just calm, right? Like it's the the lake is calm, the breeze through the trees, nobody else, yeah, I can see there's other cottages, but like nobody's doing anything on occasion, a boat goes by, that's it. That's like peace in heaven to me. And so I'm super excited that like recently now I'm like, oh, now that I've had this realization <laughs> and it, it might've been live, you might've heard it first that now we can kind of say like, you know what, instead of going to the beach this year, we're going to go over here. Uh, we're going to go, we're going to get a cottage, a cabin in the middle of nowhere, put on the fires and the bonfires that we like and just sit and enjoy nature in a, in a way that I love doing it um, so that we can kind of see which version do we like the best. And it can be a combo. It yes. can be a combo. Yeah. And the other thing about this is that, you know, you'll get a lot of pressure from your family. They won't understand it or somebody may not understand it, but they don't need to. It's Okay. You just need to be like, this works best for us. And I hope that you would appreciate that and respect that. Danielle, you're an honorary Feel Good Fatherhood member uh, because, again, this is it, right? The principle, the core principle of us in the community is facing your family, right? It's you're doing what's right by the family. You're facing it. You're adjusting your behaviors, paying attention, solving problems that they need to be solved, making space if space needs to be made, but injecting that love, attention, and care into the space absolutely love it. I'll send you the the token hat and badge so that you can always get into the private parties. It's going to be a great time. If folks want to get a hold of you and folks want to like continue this conversation with you in a way that fits best for them, where can they find you and how would they do that? The best place is my website and it's easy. www.daniellesebastian.com. Just like it sounds, daniellesebastian.com. You can set up a free call with me. I have a completely open book and my calendar's on there for anyone who would like to talk with me personally, but I also have some free resources on there as well as more about how I help people individually. Awesome. Danielle, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much. I had so much fun and I really do feel like I am speaking the language of this group and you guys keep up the good work. You're doing awesome.